Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome back to Prep Medic. In this week's video, we are touching on a very important medical topic and that is shock. How to recognize it, what's actually going on in the body and how to treat it. So like I said in the intro, shock is a very complex, in-depth issue. We are not gonna dive super deep into the pathophysiology. I'm gonna give you an idea of what's going on in each of these syndromes, but we aren't getting super, super detailed. So there is a lot that will be left out of this lecture. I will leave some resources down below if you're curious, you wanna take a deep dive that you can research and do your own learning on that. Now, the other thing I want to preface all of this with is saying that this is not medical training. This is some good stuff for you to know. It'll help in your recognition and overall treatment. But ultimately, you need to defer to your own training, your own state laws. This does not authorize you to go out and do these ALS skills. You know, as a paramedic, you have to follow your protocols. Don't be deviating because a guy from the internet told you so. So without further ado, let's get into the meat of the video. So what is shock? So there are two things people think of when they hear shock. Number one is what we're gonna be talking about today, and that is your actual physiologic shock, which is defined as hypoperfusion to critical organs. What that essentially means is that blood flow, for whatever reason, is not reaching your heart, lungs, brain, spinal cord. Now, the other type of shock people think, and what we encounter as paramedics going up to a lot of accident scenes, is psychogenic shock which is not to say fake shock, but it's to say that there is extreme emotional stressors on somebody that causes them to have a reaction. And that's when they faint or might be kind of despondent, not responding to you well for a short period of time because of the shock of it. That is not what we're talking about today. We are talking about physiologic shock. Now, there are four main types of shock and each one of those has some subcategories in them that we also are gonna talk about and talk about how to treat it. Those are obstructive, cardiogenic, distributive, and hypovolemic shock. Before we take a deep dive into the four types of shock and some of their subcategories, I wanna discuss some of the general signs and symptoms of shock and the two main phases of shock that you'll see. So first off, shock can be compensated or decompensated. Compensated simply means that the body is able to make up for the blood loss or the distribution of blood. So if somebody's losing a lot of blood, the heart will speed up to try to get more blood to those organs. Same with if somebody has a low blood pressure, the heart will try to beat faster to make up for that, to keep the amount of blood ejected from the heart the same and to keep the circulation relatively stable throughout the body. That's compensated shock. And some of the signs and symptoms of compensated shock are going to be elevated heart rate, elevated respirations, normal to potentially borderline low blood pressure, cool clammy skin, chest pain, nausea, anxiety, thirst, and decreased urine output. Now, as the body starts to decompensate, we get into, you guessed it, decompensated shock. So decompensated shock are when the insult to the body is so profound, your heart, your blood vessels, whatever's compensating is not able to make up for it. And that's when the person starts going downhill. So in decompensated shock, you're gonna to start to see altered mental status. This is lack of blood flow to the brain. That's a big problem. You see low blood pressures or a low mean arterial, arterial pressure, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Rapid or slow pulse, shallow breathing, and eventually death. Now there is kind of a third category in this, and this is irreversible shock. However, that's basically just profound decompensated shock. When you start seeing that bradycardia, the super low blood pressures, this person is close to death and has to be intervened on very, very fast. Now, when we start getting into specifics, I'm going to give you individual treatment options for each kind of shock because they do vary slightly. However, there are a couple main staples for shock treatment that I wanna get out of the way now so I don't have to list them on every single subcategory. Basically, when you're treating shock, you want to ensure oxygenation. So if you have supplemental O2, you can put that on them, make sure their airways open, make sure you're breathing for them if they can't breathe for themselves. We also wanna preserve heat at all costs. So these patients that lose a lot of heat and shock, they're not able to regulate that temperature. You have to make sure you're keeping them warm. Hypothermia kills, especially in trauma. 
but you want to make sure that you're preserving that heat, putting blankets on them, keeping them in a warm environment. And then the next one is, if they'll tolerate it, lay them down, elevate their legs. The effectiveness of elevating a patient's legs is questionable. The thought used to be the blood would get pushed back into their body, but that will only really compensate for the patient for a very short period of time, and then it really kind of loses its effectiveness. So I'm not saying not to do it, but be aware that's not the most important thing. The other thing you can do while you're laying them down, that's going to kind of help their heart uh, beat a little bit more effectively. They're not overcoming gravity to get the blood up to the head. Ultimately though, put them in the position of comfort. If they feel lightheaded sitting up, lay them down. It's not super difficult to wrap your head around. So the first type of shock we're talking about today is obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is exactly as it sounds. That's when blood is physically impaired from getting to where it needs to go. There are a couple different processes in the body that can cause obstructive shock. The first one is a tension pneumothorax. In a tension pneumothorax, a lung collapses usually because of a traumatic insult and pressure starts to build in the thoracic cavity, causing more and more pressure to be exerted on the heart and the mediastinum. This makes it so the heart can no longer eject blood and the lung is no longer able to oxygenate circulating blood. A tension pneumothorax will present with distended jugular veins, hypotension, difficulty breathing, absent lung sounds on one side of the body, and then potentially tracheal deviation, although that's very hard to see in a very late sign of tension pneumothorax. Ultimately, the treatment for a tension pneumothorax is going to be a needle decompression, and then eventually a finger thoracostomy and a chest tube. Ultimately, though, they need surgery. The next thing that can cause obstructive shock is a hemothorax, which is very similar to a pneumothorax, except instead of air filling the thoracic space, it's blood. This is treated with a chest tube and ultimately surgery as well. Cardiac tamponade is another cause of obstructive shock. That's when the sac around the heart starts to fill with fluid and it compresses the heart so it can't beat. In these patients, you'll have widening pulse pressures, so that means that the systolic and the diastolic pressure will get further apart. You'll have muffled heart tones and you'll have distended jugular veins. Keep in mind with distended jugular veins, this is only an accurate assessment tool if the patient is above a 45 degree angle. If they're laying down, most patients will present with distended jugular veins. The treatment for your tamponade is going to be a pericardial synthesis. Now that's a needle inserted under the sternum into the sac around the heart. It's usually guided by ultrasound. You can guide it by EKG, but it's not very common. Not a lot of EMS agencies are doing this procedure. However, there are some that are doing it as a last-ditch effort in cardiac arrest. There are some flight services doing it on conscious patients, but it's generally something that's done in the hospital. The last cause of obstructive shock is a pulmonary embolism, which is a clot in the artery leading to the lungs. This will prevent any blood from being oxygenated. It's very hard to detect. There are some EKG findings, oftentimes shortness of breath, or somebody whose oxygen saturations will not go above that 94% even with high flow O2. A lot of times these will be your pulmonary embolism patients. Ask patient history to try to figure out if they've had surgery recently, been on bed rest for a long period of time, or just came back from long travel where they've been sitting. These are all risk factors for pulmonary embolisms. Ultimately for these patients, they need clot busting agents. Some EMS agencies will carry heparin, but it is pretty rare and usually this is dealt with in the hospital. The next type of shock is cardiogenic shock. In cardiogenic shock, the heart can't pump enough blood. And generally, this is from a couple different mechanisms. The first one is a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. In a heart attack, one of the coronary arteries gets obstructed, and the cells are no longer able to contract the heart well. In this case, you have part of the heart is dead, and you have a decreased minute volume, so the heart's not projecting any more blood. It doesn't get enough blood to the rest of the body. For these patients, we need to get them to a cath lab as soon as possible. Ultimately, early recognition is key to the survivability of these patients. We can also give 324 milligrams of aspirin orally to them, have them chew it even though it tastes really bad. Can give nitro in some situations, that's a vasodilator, although some of the recent studies on nitro in uh, heart attacks is fairly iffy. It's not really the one thing you need to get on board we want to make sure they're oxygenating above that 94%. And ultimately, 
if they have really profound cardiogenic shock, if you're going to have to give a vasopressor, the recommendation right now is dobutamine, which increases cardiac contractility and will help project that blood better throughout the body. The next cause of cardiogenic shock is an arrhythmia. So in an arrhythmia, either the heart is beating too fast or too slow or too chaotically to effectively project blood. Patients that have SVT, which is supraventricular tachycardia, that's a heart rate usually above 150 at rest. Uh, it can go up to 200 to 300 beats per minute where normal is 60 to 100. At rest is the key there. Those patients will ultimately need either vagal maneuvers, so that's increasing pressure at the back of the throat, or adenosine, which is a medication given very fast that will actually kind of reset the heart and get it back into a normal rhythm. If they're unstable, so they're in decompensated shock, we'll give them uh, a synchronized cardioversion with a cardiac monitor. Same thing for your VTAC. If they're going really fast and they're stable, ALS providers will give amiodarone. Vagal maneuvers are not likely to be successful. And then if they're unstable, they'll have a cardioversion as well. For your bradycardic rhythms, same thing. We'll pace them if they're unstable and we'll give them uh, some medication to get that heart rate up if they are stable. Ultimately though, the care is focused around correcting the arrhythmia. Only do things that you are trained to do. If you're super interested about that kind of thing, Advanced Cardiac Life Support, ACLS is a class. You can take, anybody can take it. It doesn't authorize you to do anything if you're not already a healthcare provider, but if you're curious, it is a really good class to pursue. All right, so the next type of shock and where things start to get kind of confusing is distributive shock. So distributive shock is when blood vessels lose tone and the body cannot maintain a blood pressure. Distributive shock can be broken down into three subcategories. The first subcategory there is anaphylactic shock. So as it sounds like, anaphylaxis means severe allergic reaction. What happens here is the body is exposed to something, some outside influence, and there's a huge overreaction of the body's immune system that causes massive vasodilation and essentially an uneven distribution of blood throughout the body. So with that vasodilation, there's no tone, it's not able to get the blood back up to the heart, and it's not able to pump out effectively, causing a significant drop in blood pressure, among some other issues that come along with it. So some signs and symptoms of anaphylactic shock, we all think of the swelling of the throat, which is super common and is an airway obstruction that needs to be dealt with, but that is not the only thing that happens. Oftentimes we'll see profound hypotension, uh, we'll also see hives at the site that the patient was exposed. If they ate something, you might see truncal hives moving up the body. And then you can see the swelling, throat, difficulty breathing, potentially stridor, which is a really high-pitched noise in and out of the upper airway, which is caused by upper airway swelling. You can also have some other systems affected. So actually having indigestion or feeling really nauseous can be a sign of anaphylactic shock. The treatments for this are pretty easy. Number one, we wanna remove the stimulus. So if they have a stinger in them, get that out. We don't wanna put tweezers to that stinger because as we squeeze it, we're actually gonna squeeze a little bit more of that venom into the body. The recommendation is to take a credit card, try to swipe it across and kind of pry it out of the skin. But however you need to do it, get the stinger out, get them away from whatever caused that reaction. The next thing we want to do is ensure adequate oxygenation, ventilation. We're giving them oxygen. We're going to breathe for them if we have to. And then the mainstay of treatment is delivering epinephrine IM. The standard dose for epinephrine is 0.3 milligrams, and that's given intramuscular in the lateral aspect of the thigh. Generally speaking, somebody that knows they're anaphylactically allergic to something will carry an EpiPen and know how to administer it. Be really careful administering meds to somebody if you do, are not authorized to do so. This is leaving you open to a lot of lawsuits and litigation. That's not to say you cannot help them take their own medication, however. Now for ALS providers, there are a couple other meds. And what we give on the ambulance, we give something called uh, Solumedrol, which is a steroid that will help after about 45 minutes with some bronchodilation, uh, make things a little bit better for them. Benadryl's a mainstay of treatment, so generally the dose for that is about five or 50 milligrams. Uh, the bystander could give that orally. We usually give it IV uh, for them, and then that's an H1 blocker. The other thing is famotidine, so that's also Pepsid, which is an H2 blocker. Uh, 
and that's oftentimes hung in a bag of fluids by ALS providers. Mag sulfate is another treatment, which is a bronchodilator. And in extreme situations, intubation and ketamine can be used. So if you have to do rapid sequence intubation, reach for ketamine because it has some bronchodilatory effects. If they are experiencing some wheezing or signs of uh, bronchospastic lungs, then you can initiate a duoneb, which is albuterol and ipotropium bromide. And that's an, an inhaler that will help them slightly, but it will not help you with your upper airway swelling. The next subcategory of distributive shock is septic shock. In septic shock, an infection has spread to the entire body, so they have a systemic infection that causes increased cellular wall permeability, and they get a lot of fluid leaking out of the capillary beds into the interstitial space. Once again, this will cause vasodilation, a drop in blood pressure. The body is unable to distribute the blood where it needs to be in the body. On the ambulance, we identify septic shock by a couple different criteria. The first one is called the Sears criteria, and this involves tachycardia, tachypnea, so rapid breathing, and a fever above 100.4 or below 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. We couple that with findings of organ dysfunction. So that can be a low SpO2, low blood pressure, a low mean arterial pressure, below 60, and mean arterial pressure is calculated by taking two times the diastolic blood pressure added to the systolic blood pressure divided by three. Like I just said, we wanna see that above 60, but 65 is kind of where we want to see it. Other findings are a lactate above two. Above four signifies septic shock, above two can just signify sepsis. And then one finding to confirm that is an end tidal CO2 sustained below 25 can also oftentimes indicate uh, a septic shock scenario. So if they have one of those, then we combine that with your Sears and that's what's called a sepsis alert. Treatment for sepsis is mainly going to be done in the hospital. So one thing a layperson could do is provide an antipyretic, so Tylenol. Uh, which will physically lower the fever. However, it's not going to do anything for the underlying infection. As pre-hospital providers, some ambulances are carrying antibiotics, which is the mainstay of treatment. As far as treating shock symptoms, it used to be we just overload them with fluid, give them so much saline. However, now they're recommending about one liter of saline and you start your vasopressors. So generally speaking, uh, I've used Levofed in the past, and I believe that's what most providers in the hospital are using, but that's gonna be oftentimes discretionary of what your medical director allows. So one liter of fluid followed by vasopressors, and then you can give some fluids after that. The final subcategory of distributive shock is neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is caused by a severe spinal cord injury that results in complete de-innervation of all your blood vessels. So like in the other two, it causes massive vasodilation. You have no more um, vascular tone and the body is not able to redistribute the blood flow. This is oftentimes called hot shock because the patient won't exhibit that cool clammy skin. They can oftentimes have a slow heartbeat and then they'll have kind of flushed warm skin there, but they will have the low blood pressure that is prevalent in a lot of decompensated shock. For a civilian, the only thing you can really do for these people is hold head stabilization. Don't let them move their head around. Just come on either side of them, put your hands on their head and just encourage them not to move. Get them help as soon as possible. So get them into an ambulance, uh, have them immobilized. Now as an ALS provider, really the only thing we're gonna do for them is we're gonna give them vasopressors. So once again, we can reach for the Levofed or dopamine or whatever you have to increase that vascular tone and artificially increase the blood pressure. For these patients, they need a neurosurgeon. They don't really need to be cared for a ton in the pre-hospital environment. We're gonna to try to get their blood pressure up, but they don't need huge infusions of fluid. They need some pressors, they need to be immobilized, and they need to get into surgery as soon as possible. All right, the last type of shock we're talking about today is hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemic shock simply means the lack of fluids. Either they're bleeding severely, which is called hemorrhagic shock, or they're simply dehydrated and need fluid replacement. So signs and symptoms of hemorrhagic shock, number one is they're going to be very dry looking, might have cracked lips, 
tenting skin, if you pinch their hand and it kind of stays in the same position you pinched it in, that's a sign of dehydration. All the signs of shock we talked about before. For your simply dehydrated patients, that could be from vomiting, lack of fluid intake, diarrhea, anything like that that's been present persisting for a long period of time. For your dehydrated patients, we can start fluid replacements by mouth. If you're an ALS provider, you can start IV fluids. If neither of those are effective or if they're still vomiting or having severe diarrhea, you can give them something to firm up their stools or an antiemetic to keep them from vomiting it up. Ultimately, we need to treat the underlying cause of the hypovolemic shock. All right, for your hemorrhagic patients, the treatment's pretty simple. We stop the blood loss first and foremost. So that's gonna be applying a tourniquet if it's on the arms or the legs. It's going to be packing your junctional wounds and keeping those compressed, stopping that bleeding so they don't get any worse. Once we've done that, the mainstay of treatment is going to be blood replacement, fresh whole blood. I completely understand not everybody has that capability in the pre-hospital environment. Blood is very hard to maintain. However, that is what the science is telling us to do. We are no longer giving a ton of fluid or Hextend or anything like that. It has been shown to greatly increase the mortality and morbidity of those patients. And that's because your normal saline, any of these uh, fluids, they don't carry any kind of oxygen and they don't carry any clotting factors. So all you're doing is filling the pipes for no reason. You're breaking down clots. You're causing them to become acidotic. And then you're just basically filling them with pasta water for no reason. So we're no longer doing that. If you have TXA, you can give TXA, and TXA is an agent that's meant to promote clotting in the body, help it stop the blood loss naturally. And then if you're giving the blood replacement and the uh, TXA, the other recommendation is calcium, and calcium is thought to help with the clotting process as well as help the hyponatremia that comes with blood transfusions. The other thing I want to stress in this shock particularly is keeping the patient warm. Once a patient becomes hypothermic, which is very easy to do in a shock state, even with normal temperatures outside, once they become hypothermic, they are no longer able to clot and protect themselves. So we wanna make sure that we keep them very warm at all costs. If you're comfortable in the ambulance, it's too cold, get it hotter. Thanks for watching guys. I know this was a pretty fast paced video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. I've also left some links for your perusal if you wanna dive a little bit deeper. Thanks for watching and I will see you next week.